Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Sunday morning roundtable at the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. This morning is Sunday, March 12, 2017. Our subject today is substance and the golden text, Ephesians. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Um, I'd like Betty just to make some comments on what you wrote about on the forum. You don't have to read it, just make comments about it. Okay. Um, well, I think the one thing that I noticed about the golden text was the word proving, and it came to me that it meant to demonstrate, and I looked it up, and of course, that's what it turns out that's exactly what it meant, was to prove uh, something. And the, the part that I liked was at the end of that definition was the absurdity, the evident absurd, absurdity of the opposite, which, of course, I thought of as being evil. But then I, at the response of reading, I noticed that all the responsive reading was telling you how to demonstrate, you know, trusting and acknowledging God and honoring him. And then um, he would direct your paths. Uh, you would have plenty, um, a healthy, like a wholeness. And then with wine, with the definition of wine being inspiration and understanding and, and that's what you would get in oh, directing your path. And, uh, there's a lot of benefits to trusting the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on to thine own understanding. The Lord knows I need some help with that one on time from time to time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And and this all ties in, as we talked about, and any of you who missed yesterday's Bible study, it's a good one to listen to with the, the parable of the sower and the seed, because in order to be the good seed, to be the good soil, and have that seed grow, what is necessary that you do? You have to demonstrate, don't you? You have to prove it. Otherwise, you don't... Trust in the Lord. All these things. Otherwise, you grow no root and you'll be swept away. So, whatever little bit you get, the seed being the Word of God, whatever Word of God you get, you, you apply it to your life step by step. And that way, you grow the root that will keep you from being swept away. If you're on the wayside, you'll plow your ground up and grow the root. And if you're in the thorn, thorn, if you're demonstrating it, you won't let the deceitfulness of riches or the other things pull you away because you're going to be proving it. You've got to live this science. You cannot just listen to it. You have to work it. So, and that, I thought that is a good point with this golden text. And so then to go further with the responsive reading, Elizabeth, do you have what you found in Gill? Yes. Um, this is for, um, in all thy ways acknowledge him. He said, set him before thee, have him always in view, consider him as ever present with thee, observing every step thou takest and take not one step without his leave and without his advice. Ask wisdom of him who gives liberally. Consult his word and make the scriptures thy counselors. When things go cross and adverse and not to your mind, submit to his sovereignty and be still and know that he is God that does all things right for his own glory and his people's good. Psalm 46.10 And when things succeed, Give him the glory of all. Own his hand in it and the bounty of it. Acknowledge that all you have in providence and grace come from him. Thank you very much. It's 
beautiful statement. We can use that somewhere too to think about, and we can all certainly do better always, to be always putting God before you, always thinking about him, always knowing he's with you, turning it to him for direction, leaning not unto your own understanding, acknowledging him in all your ways. Give him credit for the successes you find in your life. Very important to, yes, to stay humble and know it's God working when there are successes. So th this is part of, again, the sower and the seed, living it, proving it, and letting your, your roots grow so you're not swept away. Now, why do you think this story is in the lesson on substance? like it's talking about the substance of true devotion or what's true and real and what hold on to and false sense of substance. Too. Thank you. Yeah, right. The true sense of substance and then the false sense. I think it's also talking about substance as spirit being the only substance. God is the only substance and that's spirit. Thank you. Yes. Not, not to be fooled by what we think is, what we believe is substance in in, materi in our material surroundings. Yeah, Thank just you. to think of something else or get caught off of what real substance is. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, there's some false concepts about substance that it warns us against. I mean, the obvious one is, you know, material riches, so-called, if you actually believe, you know, worship them, believe that they are substance, they're going to choke. They're going to choke your ability to get close to God your divine substance. There are others. Well, also the care of the world. I mean, just worldly worries of any kind, rather yeah. than turning to God. Why? Yeah. Yes. Wanting to be, wanting to be pleased, to be uh, liked by others. And how about our educational system? Look at what gets pumped out of our schools and our universities. People who think that they actually know something other than God. I mean, that's a huge false sense of substance. You have a college degree? Whoa, is that substance? You have a PhD? Sounds like a lot of substance. 20 years worth of participation trophy. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what, what are you relying on for your well-being? Where, where do you turn? And when you entertain this false sense of substance for a long enough amount of time, you will find it's going to lead you into trouble, physical trouble, financial trouble, emotional trouble, because it's, it's basically it's not real. It's a false sense. And that, that quote that I gave on my testimony Wednesday, this false sense of substance must yield to his eternal presence and so dissolve. So if you are entertaining a false sense of substance, as we've talked about yesterday and now today, Get rid of it. Understand where your true substance is from. And it's spiritual, and it is from God, as this lesson brings out. Get where you're feeling that and knowing that. And you do that by acknowledging him in all your ways. You don't and that's why Jesus uh, threw the money changers out of the temple. Thank you. Yes, barely wrote this lesson, so <laughs> she's, she's a, 
Apparently. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Now that was a good point. Here was the temple, God's God's house. Here they were promoting a false sense of substance. They had to be thrown out. And he didn't do it kindly. He threw them out. And with a whip? With a whip. Very thankful for Jesus' explanation where he said that the seed was the word of God. Remember, this is the word that he was confident that would live on forever, even though he spoke in a declining language, even the dull years, but he was so convinced that this word of God would endure forever. And that was the substance of anything and everything. So it's the word of God. So for me, it was very helpful. What is it that I want? I just want to hear God's word. I'll carry it. Yes, and that is the seed. And that's what you let grow in you. That's what you fill your mind, heart, and soul with. That that word of God. That's why we study the lesson. That's why we write down a statement each day to keep with us or memorize statements. So we that's your arsenal that you use during the day when other things try to tempt you to believe in some other sense of substance. <clears throat> I believe it Kimball and Big Del Young say in, in any problem, any problem, three things you have to handle. A law, cause, substance. Law being that you've got a material law that's trying to govern you, govern you rather than the divine law. Cause, that you have some material cause for this problem. You didn't sleep enough or you, you know, whatever. <laughs> some cause rather than God being the only cause. And then finally, substance, that your substance is in matter. If you if you believe your substance is in matter, then then all of this era has something to pin itself on. Right there. If you know it's spirit, it won't find you, it can't find you. How can you be sick? <laughs> How can you be upset if you're in, in the spirit of things? You, you can't be mesmerized. You cannot be mesmerized. It is the safe place. Yes, it is a secret place of the Most High. So this proper sense of substance is, is very, very important. Now, yesterday I heard from Bob in Colorado, sometimes known as Parsons, and many of you remember him. He used to write a lot on the forum, beautiful things. He's been busy with other projects lately. I'm hoping to get him to write more, but he always says very interesting things, which I feel will can be applied to this lesson. And he also says hello to everybody, too. One thing he talked about was something called, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, a city, I think. It's A-C-C-I-D-I-E. And he said that it is one of the seven deadly sins. It was considered in medieval times to be the worst. And his description of it was, it's when you get God's calling for you. God is telling you to do something, and for some reason you refuse it. And I'm sure in thinking about it, we probably all get it. This is our divine destiny, and if, if we're realizing God is always talking to us, he is telling us what he would have us do. So what you do, rather than fulfill your divine destiny and listen to what he's saying and maybe make necessary changes in your life, you go shopping at the mall or you turn on the television or you become really interested in sports and you watch sports all the time. In other words, you just tune out that divine voice. And that leads to, well, a human destiny, the Adam dream, which is never anything good. And it goes along with this story of the, the good seed and the good soil. Because 
when you're the good soil, you will hear that direction, you will follow that voice, and you will fulfill your divine destiny, even if at times maybe it's not something that's easy to do. It might mean that you have to take some, make some changes that are difficult, but you're willing to do it because you love God and want, want to obey him more than anything else. I want to show it what happens when you do that to my God's call. Thank you. Very good example of that. Jonah. Get up in the belly of the whale. All right, the other thing, um, Bob is a, a music teacher. He's very, very much involved with young people. He loves young people. His whole life he's worked to help um, our youth. And... Uh, so, you know, uh, there has been, and I, I know others of you have told me about it, almost an epidemic of suicide, young people, not only sometimes shooting themselves, but shooting others. And he said in the papers, it doesn't, it doesn't really get the, uh, the reason, or part of the reason as to why it's happening. I mean, they always go to more gun control. But he said that there is a drug, an uh, antidepressant drug, and I'm not very good at remembering names of these things. It's something like Seroton or anyway, it begins with an S. It says it's in a lot of these antidepressant drugs. And with those drugs come all kinds of things. I mean, I guess perhaps some people find it effective, but some don't, and they hallucinate. He talked about some person who was just dreaming, having a very real dream that he was committing suicide um, and maybe going to kill other people. And his wife woke him up from it, but he was on that drug. So I'm bringing this out because this is definitely, we've had it in our watches, but we must continue to watch over this drug industry. It is very dangerous, drugs. And as much as you can, you keep yourself off them, and anybody you know off them. Sometimes you can't, and if you can't, then you know that it can do no harm, but you need to know that. So, um, uh, one problem is that painkillers are much overprescribed, and since they're wildly expensive, people turn to cheap heroin on the street. And our state, among others, our state has just declared a state of emergency in Maryland for heroin, heroin addiction. Thank you. We have that same problem in Georgia, and it ha it's happened to these teenagers, and they get their wisdom teeth taken out, and then the doctors prescribe um, a very strong painkiller, and they get addicted to it, and then they go to heroin, and it's happened a number of times, and it's terrible. Wow. Can I add one of the things um, I've been reading about is the lack of the youth knowledge of the Bible. And there's a trend that's going on in the last six years. There's a huge skepticism and uh, antagonism for the Bible that's growing. And then if you don't have exposure to the Bible, you might buy into that. It doubled over the last and six years, this skepticism and antagonism. So this lack of being in touch with the Bible is a huge problem for our youth. They don't even know what the Bible is, and they're being told it's fable, man-made, ancient, dangerous. Um, there's another word I can't okay. think, fiction, but there was a, that it, um, anybody who reads it's a heretic or crazy or um, extremist, and that it's dangerous. Of course, this is the influence of Islam. Right. Yeah. And actually, Islam is something that Bob has been studying and spending a great deal uh, investigating uh, how that works and how it influences. And he knows now, he's certainly read enough, he's certainly told me things, but that he knows that, again, the only answer is, is in prayer and in science. And, again... Yes, it's a drug problem, but then, and thank you, Linda, because that we take one step more. And what is that problem? Why are the children on the drugs? Well, um, Elizabeth gave one example where here doctors are over-subscribing, but then 
prescribing, but then Linda, it, it, they're not getting this truth of the Bible in their home, where at one time, our country was a nation of Bible readers. Everyone read the Bible, and I'm not firmly convinced that there aren't a lot of people that are still reading the Bible. There still are a lot reading it. There are. Yeah, I would say that it's been longer than six years about that Bible thing. Yeah, this is just based on t statistics of people who've been doing it for 40 years and they've been following and the trend in the last six years, and I think the six years is an important trend to pay attention to. It's been skyrocketing. And those oh, of yeah. you, Linda, Elizabeth, some others who have children know this by what their children tell them, what they say. Um, what goes on in their schools. And what goes on in their schools. But so, a lot of parents are themselves on, on medication, from tranquilizers to painkillers. So what are the children seeing? Exactly. So, and they, they don't read the Bible. They did not ever read the Bible, and they don't teach their children to. It got taken out of our school. It got taken out of our school. And we can work on all of these things and not, um, not feel shy about doing it. You also uh, have to remember that Mrs. Eddy wrote in prose works that uh, the Bible was never so widely used and read until Christian science came along. Yes, and it is partly why, or maybe majorly why, we have our Bible study. And again, I thank Tom for that. And then, but Linda, what did you discover is that one of the cities that least oh, reads yeah. the Bible? They did a, one of the statistics that they followed was cities that read the Bible the most and cities that had the least Bible reading. And I believe in 2016, Boston was second to last. Reading the Bible. Reading, reading the Bible. Now, we know that a lot of that is because of all the college students. There are a huge amount of colleges in, in Boston. But where in the world are the Christian scientists? And who was telling me? Benjamin, you had a friend who went to Boston, and what did he say? Yeah, I met uh, this friend, and I don't know where she was born. I she was born, but she lives in Boston. She lives in Boston, and she still lives there for many years, and that's where she grew up. She went to school there. And I was telling her about our church, and I also told her that we have, um, that the church began from the very where she lives, and we also have a very huge presence in Boston, one of the biggest buildings over there. So she never saw the building. By that place many times and I never saw the building. And I was shocked that she never saw it. I've heard this before. People have lived there and they, they don't even notice it. What does that mean? What did you say? Yeah, um, Mary and I, we start to think deeper about the situation because it's almost impossible not to see the building. It's the biggest journey I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, torture, I it's, a, it's a shape yeah. that's unusual. Yeah, it doesn't no, look like the other one. It doesn't look like the other one. Then thinking deeper, we found out that the concept of building that building, and why Mrs. City was not happy about it, it was a very wrong concept about church. And for, because of that wrong concept, the church is hidden. The presence of the church is not there. And we thought, if it was the smaller building, the one that was hidden now at the back, the one that she authorized and inspired for. If it was that one, if that was the only building in Boston, there's no way anybody would not see that building. That building would be the name of sight. That in the big one that had the wrong concepts behind it, it doesn't have space. But it's not there. Well, and was I, the, excuse me. I just wonder, Fina, was the pool there uh, with the original building? doesn't seem like no, it. No, 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 no. Oh, no. 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 Okay, so now I, the, the reason I ask is because I lived in Boston. I was around the commons where it is, and I don't think I ever, it, it didn't occur to me. Well, I wasn't a Christian scientist then, but it's surprising to me that nothing striked me because 
people come, a lot of people come, but they come to enjoy the pool. They just uh, around the, the, the ref, that reflective pool. More the attention is on that. So very interesting. Yeah, right. Play in it. Children yeah. come mm -hmm. and play in the water. Right. And uh, we, we were there once where somebody had a had a model boat. He was he was you know remote control and he was running it throughout the pool so that none of the kids could actually get in it because the boat was racing up and down the pool. It used to be a beautiful park with beautiful trees. Yes, it was beautiful, and I don't know why they took all that down. And the the original, you know, edifice. I mean, I, I don't think it started out. Obviously, Mrs. Eddy was there, and she she did want it. But I think what it has become, there is nobody's home anymore, and so you don't even notice it. Benjamin is saying it's like it's invisible. Um, I, I only say this because I've had so many people tell me this, that they don't even notice it there. Um, it's a very strange occurrence. And I have told you, I've, we visited the Boston and a concierge. She'd, concierge had never heard of Chestnut Hill. Concierges are supposed to know about places and areas around their hotels. So, uh, Talk about a veil. Yes, a veil. Talk a about a veil. One of directors wanted to control all of it. Yeah. And they've made it invisible. Yeah. And they wouldn't let it out, let it be free. Yeah. Because no one can see it. I remember the first time I went to Boston, to see that place. I wasn't fully going there to see the whole building. I was more impressed at seeing the one, the small one. And I was happy that I, I went in there because I wanted to see, I wanted to feel that inspiration that she had. I wanted to feel the way she felt when she first stepped, stepped into the building. Not the big one. I was happy I did. But the original, the original, sweet original, yes, yes. It's, it's quite a story, those of you who have read the story, the whole story of, of everything. And one of them, I mean, what does she call it? A, a church in prayer or something. Anyway. It has the right concept. It does. It has the right. Uh, I just want to say that I remember when they tore apart the old park, and everybody's telling me how wonderful it was. I was reflecting upon it and all that, and I didn't get it. I thought they destroyed, destroyed something beautiful. I agree. And I hated what they put in, and I felt like I was the only person that felt that way. Everybody oh, else was gaga over this. Oh, this is so wonderful. Oh, it's gorgeous. I'm so glad they tore apart the old park and put in this reflecting pond. Oh, it's so spiritual. Oh, that, oh, and everything. I felt okay. so alone, actually. I, I don't know anybody who was upset by it, uh, except for maybe um, uh, yeah. a couple of my grandmothers. But, you know? No, I'm Mrs. Singletary, Mrs. Singletary, wasn't that a, 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 a prayer in stone? Yes, thank you. That's what the words I was looking for. Thank you, Karen. A prayer in stone. That's what she called it originally, which is a beautiful concept. And yes, now it's all cement. Since they took away the park, there's this reflecting pond, but it's all cement, all buildings, all, and most of the buildings now are empty. So anyway, we're... Uh, but what that shows, Tom, is how asleep so many people yeah, right. were the time. Because how could you improve on what Mrs. Eddy had approved? How could you improve on that? So we're going back, though, to the point that uh, the lack of youth knowing the Bible and understanding God, because this is what gets people hooked on drugs. It is. It is. And when there is light, the darkness cannot come. And so it's been a great failing of Christians and, and certainly Christian scientists, and we all have to take our share of responsibility. Uh, and that's why we have to keep our Bibles and keep the light going and keep sharing and spreading the word with everything that's in us. Mike, Mike brought up a good point. The advent of Christian science opened up the Bible. True. It, it, it illuminated the Bible and brought people to the Bible and encouraged a lot of people to read the Bible 
that had never read it before. And when she left us and the human mind took over in Boston, it didn't want to be the light. It didn't want to come out from the material world and be separate. It, it didn't want to be radical. It wanted to be accepted by society. It wanted to be more like the other churches. It wanted to be humanly acceptable. And it lost the light. It stopped, yeah, stopped illuminating the Bible. And that's where we find ourselves. And that's what I read last week on that little book, Overwhelming Evidence, um, 30 years after Mrs. Eddy left. And Mrs. Mrs. Evans used to say that, too. She said it was in the 1940s the decline started um, because people that were taught by Mrs. Eddy and all of these great workers were leaving this earth. And, and then their books, you weren't allowed to read anything they wrote. And it was all working. But it can't work. We're here, and others, their lights are shining. Many others' lights are shining, so we keep that shining. And we protect and pray and work with our youth, and we watch for our youth, um, because that's the intent, to take over the youth, to destroy the past, the, the, the good thing, the Bible, the knowledge of God. Um, and so they can. They, they are easy to be taken over by animal magnetism and certainly the drug. You know, um, which is what was said about uh, the church wanting to be accepted by humans. And, um, it, it's so true. It's uh, just that for since forever, the Boston church has been obsessed with becoming a member of the Council of Churches. Yeah. And, and, That's another point, yes. And, and what a wrong thing to desire. We should, we, should, we should crave to be accepted by God and nothing else. We shouldn't give a... <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't give a damn darn <laughs> whether the world accepts us or not. Yeah, we shouldn't. I mean, did Jesus care? Whether the world accepted him? Or when he took the cord through. No. <laughs> and I, think, uh, I think this is all very appropriately worded because my experience coming into Christian science was I knew people, Christian scientists from the 70s, and finally in 2001 or two, I finally dragged out of them what they actually believed. We used to go... You know, we're canoeing and stuff together. So I mean, we were, you know, I would consider them very, very close friends, and uh, they never, you know, with all my complaining and all my whining and all my woes and angst and everything, they never once tried to explain to me what they believed in. And then when I did ask, you know, "What do you believe in?" I kept paraphrasing it. Well, you might not believe this, and it's finally I said not what I'm believing. I'm asking you what you believe. After about the third time, I gave up on it. They were just so defensive, and that's what I see most Christian scientists outside of Plainfield. They're so defensive, they don't even dare talk about it. I not even know how to explain it, though. That was my problem, was I didn't know it. You didn't understand it. So you couldn't. I was in the same thing where I wouldn't explain it to people, but I didn't know. How to explain it because I wasn't taught correctly. I, I think also if you don't have the conviction yourself, if you're really not deeply devoted to it, you can't explain it. I, I used to feel this way in the beginning when I, I know I wasn't so sure. I, I didn't know exactly um, what I was believing. I, I couldn't even say I was a Christian scientist until I really feel it. I know this is it, and then I could say something about it. So I guess it just shows where they are at. That's exactly it. That's right. You've got it. You have to have it in your own heart before you can share it to another. Otherwise, it, it is a, a tinkling symbol. It just is rankling. You're preaching. You're not, and you can't do it sincerely. But that's why, and that's what 
I pray that you all get here. This love for it, this deep conviction for it, that you know it's the truth. It's not faith healing. The transformation, God making you whole, the right understanding of it. And understanding it doesn't come easy. You know, you not, not just take two weeks and study for two weeks or have your class for two weeks and then go on your merry way. This is this is eternity. This is a lifelong project knowing God. And it's a wondrous thing. In Vic Nell Young's 1937 college on 129, I love this. He says, a Christian scientist must not shirk anything. If you shirk anything, you have fear. And if you fear, you lack love. And if you lack love, you are not a Christian scientist. Remember that. So when you shirk and you don't want to tell somebody something or you can't stand up for what you know to be true as best you can, then you've got to go back to yourself. Why? What are you afraid of? And if you're afraid, you don't love. And if you don't love, you're not a Christian scientist. And you've got to get out your plow and turn over the soil. <laughs> get your soil good where the seed's going to grow. Because otherwise, it's just a super superficial sense that does no one any good, especially yourself. This is, again, the soil that has no root. Has no root. You've got to get it. And you get it. We'll go back to the beginning with the with Betty's explanation of the golden text. It's demonstrating and living it. Live whatever you can. And then what Elizabeth read, every little thing you do, as much as you can, ask God for help. You will find you get it. You will get it. You can't help but get it. Do you think God put you here on this earth not to reveal himself to you? Of course not. Just haven't tried hard enough. Now, but I, but I think okay, I just want to ahead. say quickly that I think the thing that is so beautiful and makes Plainfield work is the willingness to share it. It's just that sharing it with everybody else is just such a different thing from the other. Thank you. And what Mary just read, if you love, you can't help but want to share it. You, you do. You can't and, help it. And another thing, you don't have to explain in great detail what you know when someone comes to you for help. All you have to do is tell them how you've been benefited, what it's done for you. You don't have to explain it in great detail. This is not an intellectual exercise. That's exactly true, because if you do that, then you hang yourself. We don't try Amen. to... No. I, I, I don't understand it all. I don't understand everything there is to know about God. But I've had a lot of wonderful experiences that have given me a glimpse of the truth. And I'll be happy to share them with anybody who asks. And that's how, that's speaking from your heart. That's what we have at our testimonies. You speak from your heart. You know, people are sometimes almost shocked by what people say at our meetings because they're saying, I went through this terrible time. This is what I learned. That will reach another heart. The only way to do it. You have to live it yourself. Then you share it. That's what Florence said at the beginning. Now, the third thing I want to get to that Bob brought out was he said that uh, a mother called him who had an 11-year-old child who was on the computer. I, I believe he was gaming. You know, as the children play these games. And he said suddenly he was brought to a pornographic site. And she was horrified. Now, I know once I was looking up Christian science sites, and I was on a Christian science site, and I was brought to a pornographic site. So they, they, there is, you know, you, you should think of your television and your computer as a big channel for mesmerism. It doesn't have to be because our website is on it. There's a lot of tremendous good you can use it for, but you've got to understand it can come and it, it's out to destroy our youth. It's out to destroy not just our youth, our men, everyone. It's a huge epidemic, pornography. Huge epidemic. And Bob said, medically, it damages your brain. Time right. Magazine did a study on that to show that. Like well, that's probably what he was referring to. Yeah. 
and the children don't even see anything wrong with it. They think it's natural. In fact, they think it's a bigger sin to not recycle. We did a study on that. So, get back to your chapter on marriage and chastity and all of this, you go back to it. And along with that, he told me this really beautiful story. This is a testimony on, uh, you can find it on YouTube. Anyway, so it, it's about a man who was a, uh, was a <laughs> wait one moment. Um, Officer. Right, he was a uh, narcotics, that's the word, ar narcotics officer. And and that's a very wonderful thing to do, to want to help people in that way. But he was exposed to, you can imagine, terrible things. Um, autopsies and people on drugs. And um, and then, and I, I've heard this too, that they some, some of these officers, have to, it's part of their job, they have to go on people's computers to check their computers and they get exposed. And he was exposed to hardcore pornography. Even if the men don't want to do this and they, they tell the people they don't want to do it, but that's their job. They have to look at it and find out about it. So he had all of this horrible stuff in his mind and he found that he was having trouble seeing and he was diagnosed with um, whatever that blindness is, um, macular or something or other. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, in a matter of months, he was totally blind. Could see, and uh, it was a terrible thing. I mean, he couldn't work, he couldn't do anything, and he. But then he met a woman who was a Christian, and she loved him and saw what she felt was his problem, and he began going to this Christian church. And she urged him to go to a, um, I guess you'd call it a retreat or something, and it was called the cleansing of the mind. And he went, and there they they were, he was with these other people, tormented with addiction to pornography and other things, and they were taught about prayer and praying to God and asking God to cleanse their mind, renew their mind with the truth. And he said one night, you know, deep in prayer over that, um, he woke up and he opened his eyes and he had 20-20 vision. And it goes on. I didn't watch the whole thing, but it, it said, you know, he, there were all the medical records. Yes, he had the problem. And after this experience, no, he did not have the problem. The doctor saw evidence that the scarring had been healed. But my point being... What was it that needed to be healed? It's his thought. Yes, he had to be cleansed of those horrible images. Now, better not put those images in your mind. But if anyone has those images, and we all have ugly images in our minds from various reasons throughout our life, I'm sure there's no one probably exempt from that. That's why we study those pages 390 to 393. Mrs. Eddy says to blot out the images. I work with that a lot because, you know, things will pop up from your past, some horrible experience or something, and it's always going to happen again, or look what happened to you, and aren't you miserable? And you got to blot that out, cleansing of your mind. So in doing that, he was totally healed, which means because that time article or whatever article, I mean, it makes it sound like it's irreparable. You know, you get that, you, you can never be healed of it. It damages your brain. So, but that's not true, because God never said that. And you can be healed. You know what the Bible called the wicked one? Yes. And, you know, and it comes in and it con continuously presenting this image to you, or the past, whatever the image or experience is. So that you don't get away from it. And it's a funny try to think right if you make up. Mm -hmm. And that was blind. It does. And the faster you get rid of it, yeah. it's an excellent discussion. I'm mm -hmm. sure this is the proper explanation of the second commandment about no graven images. Mm -hmm. Be careful about what you take into your consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
you look at something, next thing you know, it's bouncing around in your brain. No graven images. Cleanse the mind. I think it also faces the lie that argues that this is natural, normal, no big deal, and has no effect, and that it's not addictive or attract, or that it's no big, it's not attractive. They're almost arguing for it. Even psychologists. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. they are. They're arguing. It's a new thing now. It's perfectly normal. You know, do it. Harmless. It's harmless. But Bob said he knows men who are bachelors who they don't have any relationships with women. They just right. go on their computers. They have relationships with what they see, which is weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Well, it's worse than weird. Yes, it's worse than weird. It is so totally self-centered. There's, there's nothing good that can come from it. So we can know, again, the truth about it. We work on these things in our watches. We, I always go back to Mrs. Eddy, what she says, the only real attraction is spirit. Um, but this is, these are the things that take people off so that their seed doesn't grow, their soil isn't good. I mean, you spend time doing things like that. And, and you think, too, think of the movies, you know, all this stuff that's in the movies. And also on television, the sexual things. It's gotten far worse. Than it was. You know, we're talking about uh, having children uh, reading the Bible. When a child doesn't know the Bible, I think he's knowing. I think it's okay to tell a child what sin is. Some people don't want to go into that topic. What you can do to be that can qualify as sin. If it's all the things that Bible talks about, all these things we are talking about, pornography, all kinds of stuff. Bible may not call them pornography, but that subject is in there. It's called sin. It's not politically correct to yeah. tell people they're sinning. If a child can know that, <laughs> if that child stumbles into a website, maybe he's playing games, and stumbles this thing from out. Does he understand the Bible, the concept of the Bible? It's I will not. This is not good. I have to run away from this immediately because it's not sin against his, not just sin against his parents, but there's somebody else called God that I may be sin against, and I don't want to be. I don't want to put myself in that situation. But if, if the child doesn't know this, he would think it's okay to look into this. After all, I'm not harming anybody. So that's why it's very important, really. Yes, it is to teach your children. And, you know, the Christian scientists, the organization where they say there is no sin, and yet they don't explain it. Um, and, and then so then they think they can do anything they want to because there's no such thing as sin. And, of course, that's totally absurd. Gary's going to have readings coming up on Wednesday on this topic about there is no evil. But then how Mrs. Eddy explains exactly what that means. Um, and the only way, what did, what did Jesus say to the adulterous woman? Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. Go and sin no more. And what was her sin before? What was this we are talking about? Because she was adulterous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any comments? You're all very quiet. I hope I didn't. <laughs> Don't mean to monopolize it. <laughs> well, I, I do feel that television can be a thing for good. I watch things on there so informative that are just beautiful. I watch Animal Planet and all the, 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 that they do for animals, you know. It, it, it's just wonderful. And I, I watch Queen Victoria. I like to watch the PBS channel. And, and, and there's such, such, you get such glimpses of good, you know. It's not all evil. It's what you watch. That's that's you yeah. know. Absolutely. It's just, it's just sure. like what you read. You know, it 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 has to be good. You know. Right. Right. And you should watch true. what you watch. You should watch the books that you read. Yes, it's true of movies. It's true of everything. The computer certainly. You be selective. But the main thing is you watch that your soil stays pure. It doesn't get corrupted, so that the good seed will grow. Um, I'm going to end now. I'm going to read something uh, that on Bicknell Young, 1937. 
it's a treatment for tuberculosis, but it is about substance and how whatever, if you're having any physical problem, how you can use this right concept of substance. Tuberculosis is a belief that substance can be disintegrated. Establish substance as the basic fact and then deny the false claim. You restore substance because you have a realization of the real body. Do not let the patient say he has no body. That's one we hear, hear of occasionally. Get him to declare the allness of God and man and the perfection of body. Disease is, is a specific era about body. Consequently, a specific statement of truth is necessary to correct it. Know that the spiritual body is so substantial, so tangible, so real, that true spirituality is a practical thing. There is no substance out of which matter could be made. The claim is a substanceless lie without cause, foundation, principle, activity, or manifestation. There is no substance out of which it could be made. It is without space, place, occupancy, entity, or expression. It is the shadow of an impossible lie without existence. Thank you all for joining our roundtable, and we will, we're will we going to have a glorious service coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.